honored to uh, uh, moderate this panel, and I think uh, we have a uh, very good. Uh, uh, can we get the pictures back? Um, a good panel in terms of the capital inflow into Japan and also Asian capital going abroad. Uh, as you can see, the, the uh, panelists here have all a global presence, probably except for myself. Uh, and um, so going by the picture, I'm Fred Ruma. I run this small boutique uh, uh, investment management company in Japan, Touchstone. Uh, I actually report to Yuki rather than re Yuki reports to me. Um, uh, and then we have Anne Cavanaugh. Uh, she's from AXA, uh, pre uh, pre presently in London. Uh, we got Bernard Pank, GIC. He spent quite a bit of time in uh, London as well, now back in Singapore. John Tanaka from Angela Gordon uh, over here. And uh, Andy Toda from Prologis. So this is the group, and what we kind of tried to do in the back, uh, we did sit together and, and discuss, is let's try to uh, pretend like you guys don't exist, and that we're in a room just talking amongst each other, but you are eavesdropping, and so it's rather than trying to present an idea to the audiences, everybody kind of speak their own mind. So there could be a little bit of a, a, a pinchy comment that comes out here and there, but uh, if so, uh, please be very, very uh, uh, nice to us. Um, and before I kind of jump in and, and get everybody uh, to do introductions and so on, I just wanted to go just run through, rather than flipping through page by page and, and running a program, kind of cover what we want to mention today. And am I, am I supposed, can I use this? Okay. So, all day long. This has been discussed. Mr. Takenaka this morning talked about the first arrow, the th second arrow, and the third arrow, I remember seeing a broken arrow. And now it was supposedly like a hundred toothpicks. And then now it's, a, according to Financial Times, thousand needles. And uh, I had the uh, 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 honor of sitting next to Mr. Okamoto, who is the cabinet, uh, works for the cabinet for the rejuvenation or, uh, of the Japan economy, and he said, needles, Fred, remember, acupuncture. One needle could hit the right spot and cure a lot of things. So I told him I would say this in public. Um, so we got that. The second, third era, what's happening? And this is the kind of stuff that we'd like to go over. How did Abenomics really change in the, the market in the last three years? So Abenomics has been in existence for three years. How has it really changed our activity, our perspective, from where everybody stands from. Is inflation coming or what's going to the wages, right? And because it's a capital market, and, and I, I sat in the back, and I know people in the back cannot see this, but what I wanted to do here was when the Nikkei was 38,900 yen, the total market cap of Nikkei was 590 trillion yen. Today, the Nikkei index is 20,500. I didn't check today, but it's 591 trillion yen. So the index, the index has changed, but the Nikkei total market cap now is above where it was at the bubble. And if you were to go through and look at the top 10, NTT and Toyota are the only ones that are staying there. And it has changed. A lot of it, truthfully, because Banks have merged, so the, there is no IBJ today, it's Mizuho. But that's what I wanted to mention. And this is sort of the liquidity, and, and the part that I, I, I wish that everybody could see here is the foreign trading volume at peak in 89 by foreign traders were 8%. Today, 68%. Holdings is 4% versus 31%. So I think this is the big difference. Um, real estate, I think all day long we've been talking about this. What makes Japan so attractive? Is it because the UK and New York is too expensive? And it's just the process of elimination, everybody just ended up showing up in Tokyo? Or how is that? So we'll get into that with everybody. Um, <clears throat> inflow of foreign capital, where is it coming from? And why is it coming in? 
And, and the other thing is, is Tokyo quickly becoming a market just for core investors? Or is there room for value add and opportunistic? Because from 1998 up until uh, 2008, and then all the way up and probably until 2012, probably a lot of room for opportunistic investors. But is it still the case? And going back to, is, is Tokyo greatly different from New York and London, or similar, or how is it different? And um, I hate this. Uh, so there's, I didn't get permission from these people to put this up, but I think it's public. But there's been inflow, or there's exchange of, of capital uh, of large investor groups acquiring investment platforms. So that's something that we have seen. And these are BlackRock, Fusan, JP Morgan, these big guys. And the real estate transaction, this graph I think was presented by Jones Lang LaSalle yesterday, kind of similar. Uh, what, so I, I think everybody's saying the same thing. There's a lot of capital and a lot of transactions happening. So where is it all in perspective? So this is, this is kind of where we want to be today. So what I would like to do is go ahead and have uh, uh, from John uh, just uh, introduce uh, uh, themselves and maybe the you know, if you all can just say, are you really for or for Abenomics or are you really a little bit cautious about Abenomics or are you doubtful about Abenomics with respect to real estate perspective? So from that side all the way down. Uh, hello, I'm John Tanaka. I run the uh, Japan real estate platform for Angela Gordon here. Uh, Angela Gordon is an alternative asset manager. We manage about 27 billion of client capital, uh, about a third of that in real estate. Uh, here in Asia, we've been active since 2005, invested in about 50 transactions in China, Korea, and Japan, uh, with a total of about 1.6 billion of equity capital. <coughs> Abenomics. Um, I will speak a, a little bit more about this later, but my, my view is that the first arrow by itself alone is enough to stimulate the real estate market. And I think that's proven to be true over the last couple of years. So while I remain skeptical about the third arrow, I, I, I'm still bullish on the real estate investment market here. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Andy Toda from Pro Prologis. Um, more precisely, I'm a CFO of a Nippon Prologis Read. Um, Prologis uh, is uh, operating in uh, 21 countries globally and uh, covering uh, roughly 70% of the global GDP, which is so one of the very few uh, truly global uh, real estate companies in the world. And um, you know, Prologis uh, has floated uh, its uh, J Read back in 2013, uh, and currently the, the REIT has grown up to uh, $4 billion uh, of uh, portfolio right now. And um, about abenomics, um, I, actually I had this discussion with Fred yesterday, and um, I happen to be very pro <laughs> abenomics, and uh, I, I believe that he's uh, doing the right thing. Um, you know, it takes time to maneuver a third largest economy in the world, uh, but uh, you know, uh, the, the, the direction of uh, his policies uh, seems to be in the right thing. And, um, and, and uh, you know, and by the way, I, I have no interest in his uh, you know, political agenda, including uh, you know, self-defense kind of thing. So, uh, um, but, uh, but for, as for his uh, economic uh, policy, I, I really support him. Anne? Yeah, good afternoon. Anne Kavanagh from AXA Real Estate. Um, we manage 54 billion globally, um, but we're a relatively new entrant to Asia and to the market here in Tokyo. Um, here in Tokyo, we manage about um, half a billion euros. 
And um, our growth here has been on the back of the growth of the AXA insurance company. Um, but we're patient investors. We plan on being here for the long term. Um, and in terms of abenomics, I would say that in Europe, we've seen so many different models um, of countries getting the reforms right or wrong. Um, initially, we're, we're very, very positive about what's happening here. But I think time will tell. And um, you know, I think the third arrow is really key to the growth and for business productivity. So I think time will tell, but we're patient investors. And I think it will take time. There are some big challenges. But overall, we're positive. Thank you. Bernard. Hello. Uh, well, I'm Bernard Pang from GIC, which is the Government of Singapore uh, Investment Corporation. We were set up in 1981 uh, with a very simple mission to manage the foreign reserve for the Singapore government uh, with an aim to, to maintain the purchasing power. Uh, so real estate is one of the six policy classes, if you like, that GIC invests in, including stocks, bonds and other things. Uh, and we'll be celebrating our 35th anniversary next year, so I've been around for a while. And officially, we manage uh, more than 100 billion. I'm not allowed to say the exact number, so don't ask me that question. Uh, in real estate, we invest in what we like to call the four quadrant. Uh, so if you like, we invest in public and private, but we also invest in equities as well as debt. So. The bulk of our investment portfolio are in private equity, so bricks and mortars. But we do have a small part of our investment in REITs listed. Uh, and also we have a debt investment program. Your uh, opinion, a rating of Abenomics? Uh, I think it's... it's well, the good thing is that the Japanese government is doing something and is, is, is trying... Um, to do something to stimulate the economy after a long decade of very slow growth. And it seems to be taking some effect and there's some positive result we are seeing. Uh, of course, like all programs, you have bumps along the road. Uh, so I don't think it's surprising. Uh, but like, and I think overall, uh, you know, Japan is a, is a core market for us, just given its size and transparency. So we are also basically a long-term investor so we try to look longer term, and uh, you know, as long as the bumps along the way are not too severe, it doesn't really worry, up, worry us that much. Okay, so John is basically saying Abenomics' first arrow is good enough for the business you're in. Andy's saying um, he's very much in favor of what's taking place, and is basically saying the third arrow is a necessity to bring Japan out to this recovery, and we need to be very cautious about observing the third, third arrow. And uh, Bernard is basically saying more on the macro side, you're, you're willing to stand back and wait, and it's, it is a core market for you. Um, um, so maybe from to, uh, a question to the uh, two of you, because you've resided and you reside offshore and you're handling a lot of matters that are on a global perspective. So from where both of you stand and maybe from Anne and then and to Bernard, um, give us a, a bird's eye view, a one minute preview of how you see the global market and then and how you see Tokyo uh, or, or Japan from your just your perspective. Yeah, I, I, you know, we heard from Jen Slang yesterday that Japan is one of the biggest markets globally, um, you know, the fourth market for transaction volumes. It's an important market. Um, and, you know, I think it's also importantly for us, it's a very strong institutional market. It's got a lot of stability um, and it's an attractive cross-border market. Um, so its sheer size and value means it's key. I think regardless of where we are in the cycle, you know, I would agree with Bernard, we can take a long-term view. I think we have the same attitudes to other large markets, whether it's the US, UK, France, 
France has got some major challenges at the moment. We're a long-term investor. The same in Germany. You know, our investors expect us to maintain a platform in the large markets and will be active throughout the cycles. And that's exactly how we see Japan. So you, you, you said, you, you've used the word patient uh, twice earlier and now. Um, does that mean you are a low yielding investor? You're, you're a patient investor, but you have a risk adverse hurdle. No, I, uh, by patient it means that we can take a view of doing different things at different times. You know, I think that we invest right across the return spectrum. So we invest in core assets. We also invest in opportunistic assets. In Europe, we've got a really extensive development program. I think that when we move into new markets, we do different activities. So, you know, I don't suggest that we would come into a new market and immediately start developing. So to date, all of the investments we've made here have been cash flow investments. But over time, I think we'll, do, we'll broaden out across the sectors and also across our activities. But when you use the word patient and then you have come into the Japanese market on an income producing property level, your investment horizon, is it a 36 month exit with a, a yield or is, are you underwriting 60 month plus? It, it depends which capital we're investing for. Okay. So sometimes we're investing on a very long term basis. For other capital, because we, we manage for the insurance company which can take a long term view. Sometimes we're also managing for funds which might have a time horizon which could be seven to ten years. So it depends on the type of capital we're investing as to the um, time horizon. Okay, great. Bernard? Uh, in, in a very high level macro theme, I think there are, I probably mentioned three themes that um, we are seeing around the world. And it's probably not totally new. I, one is obviously the very low interest rate that we're seeing around the world. A uh, large part of it is, of course, due to the central banker policies and, and, and uh, monetary policies. How low is low? Um, I just read, in fact, in, in today's uh, morning press that uh, British Land, which is one of the largest REITs in the UK, have just issued a convertible bond at zero interest rate. And that's how low, and that's a corporate, that's not a government bond, that's a corporate property company issuing bond at zero interest rate. Nominal. Uh, even inflation in UK, that's a negative real rate. And the conversion of the uh, notes into the shares of British land is priced at 27% over the share price today. It's an average more than 25% above today's share price. And share price is not cheap uh, in UK. So it, that's really something quite exceptional. Uh, it reminds me, I was thinking about this last night, remind me of a movie, The Flatliners, I'm sure some of the people in the audience will remember, it's about a group of science uh, medical students who want to know what afterlife is like. So they invented this drug, they would lower the heart rate to zero and experience it. Uh, and I almost feel like that now, interest rate is zero, what's life after that when interest rates he says zero. Uh, nobody knows. Not many people have been there. So it's an interesting time, I think. Um, the second theme I think we observe around the world is that the emerging market growth has slowed down significantly over the last few years. And the gap between EM growth and DM growth has narrowed significantly. Uh, we have invested in EM significantly. We, if you like, we are significantly overweight in emerging markets. But we're taking a harder look today because the emerging market uh, is well known is going through some difficult times and adjustments and growth has suddenly slowed down. Uh, China, for example, has, has, has now been, um, you know, people get very worried when China is saying that it's growing at seven or seven and a half percent. Uh, used to grow at 9%, 10%, but you don't see that anymore. So that's the second big theme that we're seeing around the world. The third is, I think, at the moment, we're seeing different parts of the global market growing at different speeds. So they are diverging in terms of their growth path. What that means to us is that um, picking the right market 
to be investing in becomes more crucial today than it was in the past when things are growing more or less at the same pace and in, 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 uh, in congruence. But when growth diverge, market selection becomes a very crucial part of a portfolio uh, construction, if you like. So that's the, the three kind of broad theme. Uh, there are many other things, but I think those are three that stood up in my mind. Great, thanks. So we got the two uh, uh, speakers up here talking about the global perspective and how they see Japan. So John and Andy, you guys are a global entity, but you, you specifically, your activities lie here. And then this, this, path, this summit is not the Japan ULI. It's, it's the Asia Pacific, and so we have a lot of audience here that we didn't have last year. And, and so I think more specifically from your past activity, John, you said the first era was good enough for you to uh, have a, a very good last three year run. So if you could say something uh, about through your, your experience as, as far as what to the audience what it is. And, and you know, if I may just add uh, yesterday at the JLL round table, the incoming new chairman of uh, ULI said he really gets nervous when everybody in the room is in agreement with zero interest rate environment. So uh, I'm going to try to make sure that there's a, a time for you guys to rebut, to raise your hand. If you feel strong enough, you could stop us and just raise your hand because you know you have like they have them in the United States. There's microphones, and if you have a question, you just walk up to the microphone and you could stop the panel if you want. Um, but please do so. Uh, but. <laughs> Well, as I said, I mean, we, we invest in uh, China and Korea as, as well as, as Japan. And so, you know, when we're, we're thinking about the risk return in, in these three uh, countries, each of them are uh, in somewhat different market cycles, and, and the opportunities that we found in these markets have been different. In, in China, uh, we invested heavily before the crisis in um, tier two, tier three city, you know, residential development. We ended up developing about 15,000 units in, in those cities in China. Uh, in Korea, after the crisis, we took advantage of this location there to buy uh, infill locations in Seoul and develop, uh, re uh, develop multifamily uh, residences there as well. In Japan, we've been much more focused on office, the office sector, office repositioning. Um, I've been an investor for 15 years here and so I have a lot of experience in that sector. And so when I talked about economics and being skeptical about the third uh, arrow, you know, what I mean is, is that uh, two things. One is that there is a, a, an enormous amount of capital in Japan. And most of that, uh, as Takenaka-san said about the GPF, you know, $1 trillion, 60% of that invested in JGBs, yielding you know, 30 basis points of, for a 10-year bond. And that's representative not only of the GPF, but most of the pension fund sector here in Japan have a very similar portfolio construction and very little exposure to real estate, you know, 1%, 2%. And so from, from our view, you know, that there's this tremendous liquidity uh, that has been sitting on the sidelines in Japan. And so one of the, the effects, the side effects, or maybe the intent, one of the intention of the BOJ is by buying up the JGBs from the, the capital markets, they are forcing banks and pension funds to look for alternative investments. And just a fraction of that going into the real estate sector is a tremendous amount of capital. And so we are seeing that in the form of uh, private REITs, um, which did, did not exist before 2008. Private REITs are now uh, controlling assets of about $110 billion, which is actually more than the public REIT sector now. So for the first time, we have more money flowing into private REITs than we have in the public REIT sector. And I think that's a tremendous development. Uh, and so, you know, for us, that, that the liquidity is one thing. The other thing is, is that uh, we see an ability here to, you know, reposition assets. And we don't need to make bets on growth. We don't need to make bets on rents growing. We don't need to make bets on Cap, cap compression. Um, from our perspective, there is there's a lot of opportunity to reposition older assets here in Tokyo and in other major cities in Japan. 
Thank you, Andy. Okay. Um, as I said, ProLoad is, uh, is investing in uh, 21 countries globally, and uh, but there is a common theme uh, of uh, the our investment pattern, and basically, um, you know, uh, the the highest priority of um, our <laughs> investment is a uh, you know in this uh, you know uh, you know uh, the world of uncertainty. Uh, you know, we have a lot of uncertainty in the world, and we don't know what's going to happen 10 years from now. But anyway, in um, most uh, developed countries, we have a reasonable level of a predi predictability uh, of, of what's going to happen. And uh, let's say four years ago, after the earthquake, uh, Japan was not a part of that community because, uh, you know, people were so depressed. People thought there was no future. Uh, afraid of uh, unemployment, of fragile uh, business, whatever. And then Mr. Abe took over the cabinet and uh, changed everything. And, um, and uh, created the moment, positive momentum of the society. And, um, and, and now, you know, uh, Japan, Japan, by the way, Japan has been always the most, one of the most important <laughs> investment, uh, uh, you know, top investment uh, area for prologists in the last uh, 15 years. Uh, and, uh, and uh, pro, you know, the, the appearance of uh, Mr. Abe has proven that the prologists' uh, vision in the past was right. And basically, this country has a power to, um, to provide a reasonable level of um, predictability, uh, certainty and uh, a reasonable level of return. And uh, in light of the current uh, global phenomena of a low, super low interest rate environment, still Japanese uh, real estate uh, is uh, creating uh, you know, reasonable cash flows. You know, last night we had a, a, a dinner, a cocktail reception and dinner, and I, I, I remember Mr. Saito from Mitsui Fudosan giving the introductory uh, uh, speech to bring uh, uh, Sir John Mayer as a guest speaker uh, for the dinner. And what he said was during the time Prime Minister Mayer was in office, we went through six prime ministers. Um, so I think one of the big deficiencies that this country had was prime minister obviously is not being not elected from the people of Japan it's from the political party and we just kept changing and changing the prime minister um, so there wasn't a, a strategy that could be put on the table whereas Mr. Abe is probably here to stay uh, for another three years three years I hope so I mean like I, you know the, the, the one only um, noise here is that you know he seems to have a a number of um political agenda which no, no, are not, get in, not, no, we're not this is a yeah, real estate conference not, get yeah, yeah. so so <laughs> what i'm saying is uh you know he should uh, be in the, his office for another at least for another three or four years to to give people time and uh you know company management to to turn around a uh, grow business and uh and uh, that's the uh, the nature, uh, essence of a third alloy. You know, the, yeah. it could be you know collection of uh, thousands of uh, needles, but uh, I think uh, that's uh, the nature of his message. So I think we're all in agreement that Japan is doing something completely different than the past, and it seems to be going in the right direction. Um, there are probably people in this room that have very split opinion as to where we are in the LaSalle clock. Are we at 12 o'clock? No one, no one believes. Who thinks we're at 12 o'clock right now? Nobody, right? Who thinks we're at 6 o'clock? Nobody. See, these are the two extremes. What I said at the round table yesterday was, Japan was at 12 o'clock and said, no, 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 Lehman shock has nothing to do with us because we're decoupled and we went to 4.30, boom, right away. And when Japan hit 4.30, we thought we were at 6. But it wasn't. And it went from 4.30 to 6. But then from 6 to like 8.30, this is all my personal opinion, 6 to 8.30 was quick. And maybe we're at 9 o'clock, but from 9 to 12 may take a long time to get there. 
maybe three times as much as how it went from 12 to 4.30. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, like, you know, sometimes we uh, talk about, you know, in the which inning of the ball, baseball game we are. And, um, you know, the assumption of the, the, the argument is that whether the game is only for ninth inning, and, and uh, you know, we may end up with an uh, 18th inning game or a 27th inning game. So uh, if uh, I don't think it goes that long. <laughs> uh, Fred, I, I think the other way of asking your question is maybe you should ask the audience, uh, what's their investment intention vis-a-vis -vis overseas investment? Right? How many people are actually in this room uh, who are not just looking in Japan, but actually have an intention or are already investing outside of Japan? And, and think that maybe the overseas investments offer a more attractive opportunities. And maybe we can just have a quick show of hands how many people in the room are actually investing outside of Japan and, and feel that, in fact, the opportunity is, 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 could be more interesting outside of Japan. Or maybe Tokyo specifically. Who's outside of Japan? Well, there's more than that. So everybody thinks that Japan is at 6 o'clock. That's why. That, that, well, no. Well, Japan was at 6 o'clock for about five years, and it's really only since last year that we've moved past 6 o'clock. So, you know, from our perspective, we're still at an early stage of recovery. So I would, I would say we're more like, you know, 8. I, I think that's, that's the issue with the, yeah. with the uh, clock, not to criticize yeah. John's slang, but right. I think it's a very good way of depicting where we're in the cycle. Right. But when you say it's a clock, right. you, you have this notion that the clock is moving in certain direction at certain speed. But the clock can be stuck there or even go in the other direction. You know, actually, I was uh, 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 sitting down with a, a gentleman over in the coffee room, and I, I mentioned this. And I said, OK, from 12 to 4.30 was quick. And it stayed at 4.30. And I think it was the unfortunate event of March 11 that just, boom, took us to the bottom. And then we stuck in the bottom for a while. And then Abenomics shows up, and then, boom, it starts moving and we're at 9 o'clock. And at 10.30, we might come back to 9.30, and then go all the way back up to 12 o'clock, using a long more, lot more time. But John, you, the last three years, when you, when you were sourcing transactions to, and you do, so, you do some bulky transactions, uh, how much d more difficult is it to do, repeat what you did three years ago today? Well, I mean, you know, clearly we're in a different, uh, you know, we're in a recovery cycle now. And, and, and so the market conditions are, are different today. Um, and so saying that, you know, we could do the same thing that we did three years ago, I, I think would be uh, a little bit aggressive. Um, but I would say that um, we continue to see opportunities, not only in Tokyo, um, because three years ago we only invested in, in Tokyo, but uh, today we, we began investing in uh, the Kansai area, bought a property in Osaka last uh, March. And, and so, you know, Japan, I think, it's an interesting opportunity because the real estate cycles in the regional cities is sort of like where Tokyo was a year ago. Um, and, and so we continue to look for opportunities, uh, both inside and outside of Tokyo. So, you know, okay, go ahead, then I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, so I was just going to comment on, you know, what we were doing three years ago is very different to today as well because you know, one of the other factors is that there's more debt available today. You know, three years ago, there was much more of an equity-driven market, um, certainly on a global basis. And so the type of investments you wanted to make, I think, were very different. We hadn't started to see the economies recovering um, other than in the US. And so, you know, for example, when I look back three years ago in Europe, we weren't really doing a lot of value-add investing because the leasing markets were not moving at all. There was no leasing demand. And so, you know, I think this is what we see as we move through the cycles, and I think it's what's been happening here in Japan too. Until there's really concerted um, active business demand and business growth, it's very hard to see value-add investing really take off and produce returns. And so, you know, we've certainly seen growth in our portfolio here as businesses are starting to be more active. And, and also, debt here is, is readily available and, and very attractive levels. So, you know, I, th I think the climate is different. 
and, and it'll keep changing and evolving. Okay, so and from, from where you are, if you were to just take macro, macro today, London, New York, and Tokyo, tell me what time it is. Hey, do you know, Opinion. yeah, okay, but I, you know what I would say is that different sectors are moving around the clock at different speeds, and as you say, some things are moving backwards, some things are, are moving around the clock very, very fast. I think it depends which sector you're in. You know, if you're in um, prime Manhattan, buying core buildings, you can take a different view than if you're buying value-add buildings or doing development. Um, so, uh, you know, one could say that's a politician's answer, but I think that's also what makes a market. You know, we would all have a different view, and it can be a different view not just on the market, but on a micro-location or on a particular asset. Right. And, and that's what makes real estate so interesting. So let me, let me make a comment, and you guys tell me if I'm wrong. Um, uh, I may have said this yesterday, but I feel like office is probably at 8.30, 9 o'clock, moving very, very slowly to 12 o'clock. Super high-end luxury residential is probably still 6.30. I think hotel sector is probably on fire and still at 7.30 or 8 o'clock have plenty of room to go up. Um, ordinary Japanese residential resis may be close to 11 o'clock because REITs are having a hard time uh, pricing the residential. Um, so in Japan, REITs are supposed to be the core ultimate investors that are very long term. Uh, I was just in New York last week and uh, was able to sit down with Joseph Azelby from JP Morgan and, and he said, now what they call core in the United States is a, a, a chunky real estate that has steady cash flow, 20% leverage is what they call core. When they put 40% leverage on it, they call it core plus. So that was a little shocking to me because it could be the same building. If the investor wants to put 40% leverage on this, they take it to the core plus fund. And if it, they're very, very cautious and only want to do um, uh, 20%, and uh, my, my uh, honorary dear uh, investor client uh, from Germany, I believe their uh, uh, portfolio in Germany is almost no leverage. Uh, so you have that kind of environment. So tell me if I'm wrong in terms of what time it is, or you guys have a different opinion. Um, I would say, you know, you know, as um, I didn't mention logistics. As, what uh, time is logistics? It's a good question. Um, you know, by the way, logistics is uh, one of very, very few property, property types uh, which ha have been uh, already uh, achieving a rent growth in Japan. Uh, you know, our portfolio is achieving almost like a more north of two percent uh, rent growth every time we renew leases. So uh, it's a growing you know, cash flow kind of business. And uh, I would say in light of the uh, growth potential, you know, maybe eight or nine o'clock. Office? Uh, oh, no, no, logistics. How about office? Office, um, I agree with you. I mean, like, uh, you know, maybe it's, uh, did you say 7.30? Um, I said nine. Nine, but anyway, you know, <laughs> in the morning, uh, and uh, it, it's gonna- hotel. Uh, okay, <laughs> um, it's gonna go up. Uh, and uh, it takes a long time. And um, the reason why it takes time is that, uh, you know, typically um, the, um, you know, growth or, you know, value add kind of a, you know, business opportunity uh, comes from some kind of uh, malfunction of a banking system. And uh, that happens, uh, happened seven years ago. Yeah. And, uh, and, and then, you know, all the central banks and, and the governments decided to bail out or rescue all banks. And uh, that has um, ne necessarily uh, slowed down and uh, lowered the expected return because uh, there is um, affluent liquidity globally and uh, you know, the, uh, there is no uh, low hanging fruit in the market. You know, you know going back to Anne, what you said, um, uh, every sector is different. And, and that's why I threw out the clock. And it's probably my opinion is, let's say office is at nine. I'm saying it's nine o'clock. It's gonna take a long time to get to 12. And hotels at 7.30. It may reach 12 o'clock before office goes to 12 o'clock. 
Residential may stay 11 o'clock for another two, two decades, right? High-end residential may go from 6 o'clock to 12 o'clock in a matter of two years uh, or one year because we really don't have these $10 million flats. I, I was just able to go to one show flat, showroom in New York where Varnado is building a, a, a condominium on South Central Park. It's called 220 CP, CPS. South CSP, and uh, they kind of give you the digital floor plate, and they gave me a view of Central Park on the 36th floor, and they said 3,000 square feet, Mr. Uma, just for you, $36 million. <laughs> you were, and I translated this in tsubo, yen per tsubo. I bought three, no, I didn't. <laughs> I kind of looked at her like, you don't think I'm a buyer. But it's 45 million yen per tubo. And no marketing, out of 82 units, 40 units were sold to locals. I don't want to be rude, but you know, it used to be the China, Chinese and the Russians that came in and bought these $60 million condos. And so it, it is a crazy market. I think London is like that, right? But I think the clock is different um, uh, from where you see and is there a part of Tokyo market that you kind of scratch your head and say, why isn't it this way? Because other parts of the world have this kind of characteristic. What makes Japan unique or a little odd? I, I think one of the biggest things um, is that Japan has been in a deflation, low inflation environment for such a long time. And we're only just starting to experience that in Europe. And so in many ways, you know, I think what is interesting is um, I think there are probably a lot of learnings and experience here that could be used in other markets. I mean, we're not, we have not been used to a low inflation or a deflationary environment. We're seeing, you know, in some markets in Europe, we're seeing rents um, decrease, going no, you know, you, you can argue on the clock that some markets could stay at six o'clock for a very long time. And, you know, a lot of research pr predictions have been that um, interest rates would start to move. You know, I think we can see that this environment is here to stay. Um, and so I think that's one of the, the big things that, you know, is interesting about this market. I think the other thing is, of course, is the, you know, the shorter lease structures than we're used to in Europe as well. Um, so, you know, I think there are a lot of interesting aspects about a market we're moving into. I mean, as Bernard said, we also invest in debt and in the four quadrant model. And of course, we're comparing investments across the world and across different sectors. And fundamentally though, a lot of investors are looking for cash flow at the moment. And if you can see a consistent, stable cash flow, it can be a very attractive proposition. And this market can provide that. We, I promised everybody in the room that we will not get him up on stage and, and, and talk about specific performances and specific deals, but uh, Bernard, you are long on A-class office building. I, I think we are long on everything. <laughs> no, but, but seriously, I think, I think our aim is to try and build a balanced portfolio, if you like, because um, you know, there's a lot of discussion about where we are in the clock in the cycle, but um, I was discussing to somebody actually over lunch that, that you never know where you are in the cycle until you're six months past it or a year past it. You look back and say, oh, that was a peak or that was a trough. Um, so I, I think we, we, we very much like to, to you know, not, not to pretend that we're too smart, but just try to um, uh, build a balanced portfolio that we think can sustain over all economic cycles. Um, we do have a risk indicator that we kind of develop in-house and, and help us to keep watch over where we think certain market might be on the top half of the cycle, if you like, and those maybe on the lower half. But the success rate is, is if you do a back testing, is actually not all that good. So all we use that for is a, is a point of reference, uh, as a dot, and, and just help us to join the dots together and see if we can make some sense out of where the current market is. 
And in fact, I would say if I have to put my neck out there, in fact, if you look at the environment today, again, talking in broad general terms rather than specific sectors or market, you can say this is almost a golden uh, age for property. And why do I say that? You look at it, rent is actually still very low uh, relative to what it was before the GFC in most market. Supply pipeline is still very much manageable. Uh, you haven't gone seen supplies going crazy. In some market you start to see some development, development pipelines and high rise coming out. But it's still very much at a moderate level as a percentage of stocks. The third positive thing is there are actually moderate economic growth around the world. And that's actually good for property because it means that you can actually push rent and generate positive rental growth. So all those are very positive sectors. And the last thing I've mentioned is again, interest rate is so low um, that has helped to suppress cap rate, although you can debate whether that's good or bad thing and whether that's sustainable. And, and, and one last point, there's actually a lot of capital being allocated to the sector. So, you know, it's, it's the outlook for property market actually is pretty positive if you just take that into account. Now, what can go wrong? I think what can go wrong is, is we all start to shoot ourselves in the foot and overpay for something by being too aggressive and want to win that bidding war, war right? Because there's no price for being second. And we all like to be champions. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, after you lost on one bid, you go to the next one, and you happen to lose it again, you start to sweat. And you say, I'm going to win the third one. And I think that's where things get over the top. I think so that's really the, you know, the, the risk in, in, in our sector, if you like. Uh, and, and final comment I'll say is just in terms of cycle, uh, there's one famous investor who, who quoted this, and I remember it for a long time. He says, market always move in cycles, right? And, and you can make, that's rule number one. The second rule is that you can make a lot of money from people who forgot rule number one. You know, when I was growing up as a, a young analyst, uh, I had a, a, a pleasure of meeting a, a developer owner, a huge landowner in New York. He said, Fred, if you're an investor, it doesn't matter what you buy. It's timing, timing, timing. If you want to be a landlord, it's location, 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 because you never sell. If you're never going to sell, you better have the right location. If you're a short-term investor, it doesn't matter what you buy. If you buy low and sell high, you make money. Now, Japan was kind of that way. And, and, oh, you know, I, I want to go back. Uh, for the people in the audience, when Anne touched upon you know, the shorter term lease and, and the fragile uh, cash flow in, in the sense when it gets weak, Japan probably it ranks in the top of the list of labor intensive asset management for uh, uh, incoming producing real estate. And that, that's kind of want to ask you, um, I think there was a comment made by someone before that if you bought $2 billion in Australia, you need four asset managers. And you need 20 asset managers for that in Japan. If you, do, do you think that's the case, John? Yeah, we, we work with uh, a variety of, of partners here in Japan, and, and some of them are very small companies, and, and some of them are larger. Um, but you know, I kind of like what Ann said about how the Japan market is, is a great place to invest especially from a European perspective, uh, because we've been investing in a deflationary environment and somehow we've been successful in, in growing the REITs, growing private uh, core funds, uh, and, and to some extent, I think, uh, successful in bringing in uh, new, uh, new product types like, like logistics here in, in Japan, um, which I think attracted a, a lot of money precisely because it's an asset class that has you know, 10-year leases, long, longer-term, fixed-term lease, um, and creates more stability than we've seen, say, in the office sector. Um, but I, I think a big challenge that remains for Japan is actually the, the supply of core investment opportunities. You know, where uh, in other markets in Asia, like in Australia, which I think is very attractive right now for many global investors, they are able to uh, um, access kind of true grade A office property, trophy properties. And that remains uh, a challenge here in Japan, 
um, because you have uh, a, an active REIT market that is closely related to their sponsors. And also you have very well capitalized um, property companies that have strong balance sheets and don't really feel the need to sell. Yeah, I, I think, you know, we'll get, one of the things I think is very interesting and, and everybody probably feels that, if you go to United States, the UK, the, the other, other Western world, uh, it's very institutional. Real estate holding is done by inv institutional investors quite a bit. And yes, we're seeing a lot of open-end fund, but a lot of the investment money being debt and mezzanine, preferred equity and equity, have terms, closed debt. And we had a lot of that in Japan, but after the Lehman crisis, it got all washed out once. And it seems like, to me, all the institutional grade real estate is being held by open-ended structures, whether it be REIT, private REIT, or a huge listed company that has no need to sell real estate. And let's face it, the last three years, everybody's been on a little bit of a sugar rush high because of Abenomics, low interest rate. Uh, one of the other things, and I, and I know you like to comment on things like this, is up until about last year, we used to hear about, yeah, yeah, Fred, the first arrow, second arrow, but look at your government debt. We don't hear, I don't hear criticism about government debt anymore, that it's 280% of national GDP and we're going bankrupt. Uh, you were going to say something, but before that comment, can you make a comment on this one? The comment, I was uh, reading, um uh, Nikkei uh, website uh, before coming here, and uh, you know, you know, the, the newspaper was uh, debating about uh, the what kind of solution uh, you know exists, and, and uh, there was no conclusion. So um, you know, it, it's a quite um, hard to answer your question, but uh, but but at the same time, um, anyway, if you measure the the amount of uh, government uh, deficit by money, then um, the money, the value of Japanese yen is uh, declining. And uh, you know, it has declined almost like a 33% from the peak back in uh, four years ago. So, um, and uh, I don't, I'm not saying that uh, it's gonna go further down, but uh, the magnitude of uh, you know, deficit has become lighter in light of the size of government's asset. So, uh, you know, there, there should be some kind of solution. You know, uh, and then going back to what John said, we're, we're seeing, I, I guess this whole panel is saying, uh, uh, global investors are, have been here for many, many years, or have been here the last five years, or willing to come in here. And I just was on a call last night with a, a, a co-worker of mine uh, in the same industry, and he was talking about an Italian life insurance company that is now going to go abroad. He says, Fred, I'll connect you to this person because they may want to invest in, in Japan. So that would be brand new money, but everybody's coming in because there's inflow again. So I guess this would be more of a question to, you know, if anybody wants to answer from the audience, how many of people in the audience think there's more than five billion US dollars of equity trying to chase A-class office building in Tokyo. Yeah, I, mean, I was gonna say, say Tokyo, easily Tokyo. double that. Okay, tell me if has somebody, anybody in the audience has a $300 million A-class office building in Central Five Wards built by Kajima Takenaka Shimizu Obayashi uh, multi-tenanted with 96% occupancy for sale. I'm not talking about cap rates. Would anybody sell it? Right now, nobody's selling. That, that, I think that's, that's, that's the fundamental issue we have. Yeah, but part of that is, you know, it's about also what's happening in the other asset classes, because it's, it's on a relative basis. Let, okay, let, I, I, I know. Uh, sorry, you know, I think one of the challenges for investors globally at the moment is, you know, where do you put your capital to get a good return? And, you know, every investor I speak to around the world is generally increasing their allocations to real estate. And it's on a relative basis. You know, one of the dangers for real estate is that if we see um, changes in, in allocations to other asset classes, I mean, and that's really 
you know, one of the big risk factors, which is why most of us are watching, monitoring, as Bernard said, you never quite know until six months after the event at what point you're actually at. Okay, there's a question. Thanks, Fred. Uh, Simon Hope Savills. Um, we've, we've looked at abenomics and quantitative easing and how it's been sort of quantitative pleasing for the real estate markets, but have you seen any wage price growth here in Japan? Because, Anne, back in Europe, there'd be hardly a retailer uh, across the board, in town and out of town, who will be expecting their rent, rent bill to grow in 2015 and 2016. So has there been any, uh, any wage growth here, here in Japan because of the quantitative easing, or is it just a flow of capital into the hard asset classes and work in Japan hasn't fully benefited? Go ahead. Uh, there has been modest uh, wage growth, uh, mainly uh, concentrated in the larger you know, blue chip companies, um, but the vast majority of employment is actually in the SME sector, which I think has seen less or if, uh, little wage growth. Uh, consumption in Japan has not substantially increased. Um, there was a setback, obviously, last year because of the tax, consumption tax in increase from 5 to 8 percent. Um, I, I think the, the story right now that's driving uh, retail, especially high street retail in Japan, is the, um, you know, 3 million people plus increase in inbound tourism, particularly from Asia. Uh, there's been tremendous uh, retail rent growth in those areas like Ginza, Omote Sando, uh, uh, Shinsaibashi, and Osaka, largely driven by inbound tourism. And also, I, I'd like to touch upon, uh, in addition to wage growth, uh, I'd like to touch upon the uh, employment rate, especially for young people. Uh, four years ago, um, the, uh, the only 80% of uh, new college graduates uh, was, were able to uh, get a permanent job. And now, uh, according to various media reports, uh, the percentage has increased to 95%, which is uh, you know, you know, showing young people a bright future. And uh, that's going to be a driver of the economy, I believe. You know, when we talk about all these numbers, and I think it's on a macro average uh, level, but let's face it, you guys, if you don't have dinner reservation tonight, you know, don't plan on walking into a restaurant with a group of five and find a table in the central three wards because those tables are gone. I don't care if you're going to a 5,000 yen yakitori restaurant or a 30,000 yen steakhouse because they're all full. So. Everybody says consumption is down, but I think in Tokyo, consumption is like tripled in the restaurant area. Um, I, I, I honestly do. I mean, in, in New York is the same way. New York may be softening to the point. And, and before you start, I, 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 just, I snuck out this morning to go visit a retail developer. And because they're, they're having to do a little bit more proactive, so I think they took a trip to the United States to find contents, tenants. And they're trying to introduce it to uh, franchisees in Japan. And what the, the Japanese operators are saying, well, we, we like that content, but we can't do it because we can't hire young people to work. The labor cost is too expensive. So how are we going to open up a restaurant and pay 35,000 yen per tsubo and got to pay this person X amount? And I said, just increase the sales price, right? So, but. There seems to be this thing like Japan has nobody gets to work. Five years ago, college graduates, if you had a job offer before graduation, you were like one of the lucky few. Now, I think today the seniors are getting entertained by potential hirers, so they don't go to the next conference. You know, Mitsui, if they give an offer, they don't want the person to go to Mitsubishi Estate, so they like pull them back. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm talking about the same thing. So, uh, right? Yeah, exactly. it's entertainment for you to, to to try to get the resources. Right. I and think the, the uh, financial resources are abundant, and you're going to say something. I, I was just going to say something slightly frivolous, but don't underestimate having another million women in the workforce. You know, we're big spenders. You guys are. <laughs> you spend it even if you stay home. <laughs> They'll spend more if they stay home. 
Okay, so we're supposed to stop at 5.15, right? 5.15, I got, we got five more minutes. Um, if anybody has, okay, Ono-san. Hey Fred, um, we've been uh, living long enough and starting to, start, starting to uh, think this is a deja vu. You know, in late 80s um, and uh, 2006, we have seen this where uh, restaurants are occupied you cannot find a taxi in Ginza. And what's different? Again, the question is what's different and how much time we have left to dance with until the music stops. Is there any sense there? Do you have any opinion? You know, I think, I think there's a very big difference there. The restaurants are full, but there's plenty of empty taxis. In the 80s, if you didn't catch a cab by 11.32, you had to stay in Ginza till two in the morning. Six in the morning. But today, the restaurants are full, but you can grab a cab anytime you want. That's just particularly. Uh, they regulated they taxis. De they're more they taxis. regulated taxis, so we have. It's like 58,000 taxis. Right. Uh, I, I would say Ono-san's question is quite uh, interesting, because um, you know, there, uh, there is a difference. And uh, back in the 80s, uh, there was, we were enjoying affluent liquidity uh, created by uh, banks. And uh, you know, you know, people had money, and uh, people had to find a place to, to spend money. Uh, that was the situation. And uh, now we are in a similar situation. We have money, but the money is created by central banks. And, uh, Back in the 80s, uh, the market had to collapse because uh, banks are on the private sector, and, uh, and central banks uh, don't have to be exposed to, to market risks, uh, but then, and they're exposed to voters' opinion. And um, so I think uh, the time frame of this environment is um, totally subject to uh, how people, voters, think about our future. And uh, you know, if a voters uh, support the government uh, for you know another three or four years. Uh, I think we're going to have a reasonable time to fix uh, many things. Well, yeah. one more big difference, Ono-san. I think in the 80s there was a, I was going to say bad word. I'm not going to say that. There was a lot of uh, uh, arrogant money, right? That came from institutional balance sheet, lenders lending irresponsibility off of depositors' money. Life insurance company just spending money left and right and working out in deals in the United States in court. Uh, today, there are institutional investors investing behind managers. And so there's more discipline and, and, and scrutiny and governance. Just like Bernard said, let, let's not shoot ourselves in the foot. In the 80s, do you think anybody said we're going to shoot ourselves in the foot? Everybody said, no, land prices will never go down. Get the eighth lien on your property because we can go buy another hotel in Bel Air, right? So I think that's a big difference. Yeah, and, and you know, we look at if you look at the JREIT index, I mean it's it's up uh, dramatically over the last couple of years for sure, um, but it's sort of kind of topping right now. It's peaking right now. It's not continuing to rise. It's it's in a stable state right now. The dividend yield is three point one percent. Versus a you know thirty-year bond, a ten-year bond of thirty bips. So you, you still got a healthy margin there. Um, we don't have CB, CMBS like we did back in two thousand and seven. Um, you know we've sold a, a few assets to REITs, and I would say that the pricing is better than what we expected when we first bought the assets. But it's very rational pricing. You know I, I don't feel like the market is in this kind of irrational kind of buy everything because rents are going to go up 30% kind of mode that we were in 2007. And, and so really, you know, again, this kind of goes back to the third arrow is, you know, rent growth is going to be driven by the third arrow, you know. And, and so I, I think that's something that we all monitor and some people may, may make more aggressive bets on the third arrow working out or not. Um, I think that's kind of where we are in the market. Any more questions because Yuki's standing up and, and Bernard has to take a flight. Um, if no more questions, I'd, we'd like to be very punctual. Um, it's it's 5.15? Two, Two more minutes. 
Two more minutes. Uh, thank you all for joining us.